right, great. Thank you so much, and thank you, everyone, for inviting me to be part of this exciting series. I hope you find it to be as engaging as I imagine it will be, looking at the content and the lessons that the team with NFLRC has prepared for you. So thank you again for inviting me to participate. Um, today, and to start off this series, I've been asked to talk about theory. Um, and so I want you to know a lot of the ideas that are coming in this presentation in this 20 minutes. We'll talk between 18 to 20, I plan for 18, knowing it might go to 20, um, have lots of references and lots of things behind them. In an effort to really get at the heart of the matter, many of those references are included in the Dig Deeper section of your TED Ed lesson. And so you can check there for lots of the things that we are going to talk about today. Um, So really three major points as we address the theoretical assumptions around interaction, as we talk about what this means in an online learning context. And so as I was sorting through all the different approaches, um, I thought it would be really important that we start out with a look at interaction. What do we mean by interaction? What are we talking about really from a theoretical perspective? Um, second, adapting um, what might be a cultures of youth model and theoretically what that actually looks like and what that means um, for approaching interaction in an online, a mediated space, I, even in a non-mediated space. And then finally, the idea that learning is co-constructed um, in face-to-face -face classrooms as well as in online or mediated context. And so those three ideas will really guide our um, discussion today and the things that we are talking about. And so let's start out with a look at interaction. Um, and so I intentionally pulled this image. So I searched for people interacting. And I wanted to get a sense, really, of what sort of this Google search would mean. Um, not because I wasn't interested in what the research said, but really rethinking what it means when we talk about interaction. And so when we look at the language acquisition research and the theory behind much of this, we have two really essential approaches, or three, two, I'm sorry, two ways that people are talking about interaction. One is the interactionist theory perspective which looks at the process of interaction as a cognitive experience. In the sense, you get input, learners get input, then are given a task and through negotiation of meaning are developing skills and in taking the places where they have gaps, in taking the things that they're learning, and essentially then creating output um, based on that negotiation of meaning and through that process. And so from that perspective, Michael Long, Sagas, others have really looked at how we facilitate an interactive process to make the most sense of the negotiation of meaning process. And so if we look at that, the two little birds in the blue box might be something very typical that we see in a classroom around this experience, right? Um, or people sort of working together, the students in the bottom left-hand corner who are negotiating a task, or the doctors in the bottom space where they're trying to solve a problem and figuring that out. Um, very much a part of the classroom practice process. An alternative approach, and many would say um, don't align in the sense of a theoretical stance, is from a social informed perspective, and in that all interaction, interaction is socially and dynamically constructed, happening all the time, and that learning itself happens in these social situations. And so it's not this process that happens in practice and then becomes part of a system and then used in interaction. Um, and certainly in the case of 20 minutes, we're not going to do this discussion justice. Um, more it's about sort of priming the pump and thinking about that as teachers from a theoretical perspective, both of these processes are likely extremely important. And so understanding both of them, looking at that theoretical stance, thinking about both what happens in the internal system of the learner as well as the socially constructed affordances that we can offer. And as we're designing lessons in an online space, then allowing for tasks, allowing for problem solving, allowing for task-based learning, problem-based learning, that essentially draws out both of these interactive processes and allows both of them to happen. Um, I want to be really careful not to say that one and they both sort of happen all the time, but also that we have to have some sort of theoretical alignment. And essentially, it's about humans interacting with humans um, and what that looks like for interaction. And so as we take a stance then 
looking at sort of these different pieces. And in the Dig Deeper lesson, you'll see a really excellent piece by Jonathan Reinhardt out of the University of Arizona. And he really deconstructs what these both of these different approaches look at in terms of an online interactive learning space. So um, I encourage anyone to read that piece. I think you'll find it really interesting in terms of the theoretical approaches and perspectives to interaction. Um, Ultimately, what it comes down to from a theoretical perspective is what Steve Florence says um, in his way, right, catalyzing the development of anticipatory dispositions that enable complex, nuanced, recipient-aware, nimble, and improvisational communicative capacity. Or in other words, what we want to do as language teachers is create a skill set that allows our learners to engage in a huge variety of these communicative contexts. In the perfect sense, they can do interaction in all of these spaces, which requires some digital literacy, which requires thought about when and how we use mobile devices, that we make intentional choices of when you text and when you don't text, that we are able to engage in a video conference space such as this one, that we can do the same when we're we have a bunch of talking heads and videos and how does that discourse vary and what happens and when do you raise a hand and when do you not raise a hand. And so part of the opportunity we have in a rich digital online space um, is that we can actually build out some of these experiences for learners. And so from a theoretical perspective, it allows us to expand the context in which this communication can happen. So instead of the online space being a practice space that prepares the learners for something more real, instead really adapting this idea that we are coming into a context where actual interaction happens all the time. I was thinking back today, the number of business meetings I had just this week and the number of teacher training sessions we had in online spaces, and it's no longer just a practice space, right? It's this high stakes space where you all are taking a course, where negotiations are happening, where classes are being built and lessons. And so from a theoretical perspective, however we feel about interaction, we know we have to take advantage of that. Um, second point, thinking about cultures of use model, and this comes from Born and Pain 2005. Um, cultures of use model is designed to promote the idea that we really consider how tools mediated not are actually used in the everyday world and thus consider that as part of our educational practice. And I pulled this photo um, actually a long time ago from a meme that was going around Facebook, right? How to focus in the age of distraction, learning fundamentals, and basically essentially moving away from technology because of the inherent problems it has. But if we consider a culture of use model, and think of what's happening with technology in many instances, although it is not a medium that many of us are used to, that it takes some time to really consider and to really think about, a cultures of use model might say that something like Facebook or texting or email or Twitter is more from this perspective, in that many of these technologies are actually essentially using mediation to connect the same way a telephone did when it first, the way the same way a telephone does, the same way a letter writing does. And so essentially the technologies themselves, although seemingly quite different and expanding much more rapidly they did back in the day of the printing press or back in the day when color photographs became part of books or um, letters were written, which have been happening forever. Um, when we adopt a cultures of use model, what we say is we are going to think about how technology is actually used, what the discourse practices and the language practices in those spaces really mean, and how we then capitalize on that to enhance opportunities for learning, increasing language proficiency, and considering what that then means um, for the future and for what we're asking our learners to do. So to give you a concrete example of what that might look like, for example, um, we've seen really mixed results with the use of Facebook in language language classrooms, with the use of either using a real account or a fake account and a personality, some of it wildly successful, authenticated by the learners, really excited, and in other cases like, hey, they didn't really want to mix their personal and their professional. And in many instances, we can pull this back to the cultures of use model and thinking about, well, how did 
that particular technology, which is so ubiquitous, she is all over the world, become authenticated and used sort of in a different way or essentially outside of its culture of use in the sense of, wait a minute, why, you know, this teacher or this, my professor is just trying to be way too cool, right? And it, so in that sense, it felt sort of off in terms of the culture of use. Same thing is true looking at Twitter and looking at how the discursive practices of Twitter can be used. Um, I'll show you an example here as we get to the last piece and think about sort of the third point, which is this co-constructed learning experience. It also means then thinking about what the actual use of technology can be to take advantage of the best practices and also simultaneously help learners discern when and how they want mediated spaces as part of their life. And so it's not a celebration of all things technology all of the time, right? It's quite the opposite, actually. It's saying, let's really think about what this intentional use means and how it connects me to people and how I want my learners to connect to one another in building our online partners community, which we know is essential for good learning to happen in online spaces. Also, how do I pick the best tools to go with the best job. And I haven't seen Russ's lesson. My guess is he'll talk a lot about these tools and what happens. So just predicting this is not an actual promise. I just, um, that's my guess of what would be coming. The final really theoretical approach in thinking about what we want to talk about is this idea that learning is co-constructed, right? And so, are creating spaces, and I'll, I'll come back to this in order. I pulled actually a discussion board page um, from one of my courses um, a couple years ago, an online course on, on technology and language acquisition. And so this has to do with, this is an actual task pulled out of a Kansas course, which is online management systems. Um, and it says, essentially, right, compare these horizon reports and then they go through, et cetera. What are the differences you can find between the two reports? Any notable similarities then? As a group, come up with two to three concepts from the 2012 report that seem most relevant for language learning. There are two threads in the forum. Be sure to post, creating an original post, and at least twice in each, right? And so the intention was to get them interacting around these reports, et cetera. Um, and guess what happened? Anyone can guess, maybe in the chat window, we'll take 30 seconds, and anyone can guess what might have happened based on some of the pictures. Exactly. Someone mentioned, Stephen said they posted exactly two times, right? We saw very little interaction. Much of this posting happened, right? Fragmented, no one, maybe they did them, they weren't actually commenting on each other. and. As I started thinking about more about what to talk about today, it was exactly that sort of a failure of cultures of use model. I went back because I was curious what actually happened around the Horizon Report, which is a report created by a huge collaborative group of people. And if we look, this is what the forum looks like. This is the actual wiki forum in which you have to do it. Here's our goal. Figure it out. What are the short-term, mid-term, long-term? Exactly. Stephen mentioned it again, right? There, what in this case, there is something they have to accomplish. You have to identify the trends, comment on the trends, and if you look at the bottom, I wanted you to see the instructions of what it actually looks like in the real world. This is what people did to actually create the report itself and comment on it. But everyone gets to comment and put things right in the document and the text and really actively engage in this. And so when I think about this cultures of use model, the whole point is that, that we want to adapt the things that are happening in the real world and use them in the right way and consider it, right? Again, actual tasks around discussion, solving a problem, right? Not just saying, hey, talk to each other, but actually thinking through the ways in which different things are happening, right? So if we think of a Twitter activity, for example, it isn't about posting 10 tweets a week. It's about, as a group, coming up with a way to highlight certain social problems, which is a lot of how Twitter is being used these days, or sharing certain things on Instagram to create a photo blog, and here's your task. But the way in which that task happens isn't actually controlled um, because the way that many of these interactive features um, happen is exactly around the kind of things that are left intentionally ambiguous and 
The final piece to talk about is that just like what we see in face-to-face or non-mediated classrooms is all of this learning essentially has to be co-constructed by the learner and the teacher. And so when we give a task and an outcome, allowing alternative paths to that outcome we know is fundamental for the kind of learning we want to happen. If we consider things around problem-based learning, right, a problem is posed and then all of these things have to happen to solve the problem, but each learner authenticates that task and does that in a different way. And again, in the Dig Deeper section, we have some resources around what this looks like. I actually posted this particular interactive whiteboard for a reason. And that I think it's probably the most underutilized tool we see in online learning. And so when I was thinking about this key concept of co-construction, it was exactly this. It was, this is the place where we want to see all of these crazy things happening. So I'm imagining five language learners who need to create a semantic map. They can use colors. They can use drawing. And as a teacher, then I can actually see this process unfolding in a way that's really difficult to do, actually, in a face-to-face classroom. And so it's the advantage of an online space that sometimes I think we forget to talk about. One of the biggest concerns, of course, right, is speaking and listening. And what does this look like in online language learning? Um, but via really real life meaningful tasks and the use of something like an interactive whiteboard, which is often found in most, I think in all now, um, learning management systems, this is the place where I would imagine we see the most important authentication of tasks happening. Likewise, as a teacher, it's the place where we can see if there is a disaster happening, you know right away. It's not something that happens three days or four days after the discussion board itself is over and it's closed and like, oh, they didn't even hit on the key points that we want to happen. So, again, from a theoretical perspective, thinking about approaches to interaction and what are the very perspectives out there, both from a interactionist hypothesis perspective as well as a socially informed perspective, the critical attention to a cultures of youth model to how mediation and tools work, and three, the opportunity for learners to take control of their learning and co-construct the online space just like we very often do in a face-to-face space. Um, ensuring that there's an opportunity for rich, meaningful task creation, which can happen really nicely in things like interactive whiteboard spaces and problem-based learning modules that are outlined without too much of a linear approach. Do this, do this, do this, check this off. Um, it's a really nice example in the models you have of these TED Ed learning. It, TED Ed, right? You have a structured format, but the way that you read and the way that you as teachers decide what fits in your learning context is very much your choice and makes sense as you're moving forward in that learning experience. And so really thinking about and essentializing what can happen in terms of online interaction that we actually can't do in other places. And there's lots of opportunities for that. And I'm sure the presenters today are going to give you lots and lots of examples of how that works as well. I would encourage any lessons to have as much group video chat. We found that to be really important, which is why I included it. You get this in the hotel room as much as another conference, but um, you can see it adds some personality to what's going on. So hello, there's the very concentrated listening interaction. Um, and at that point, I think I would like to turn this over for some question and discussion. Sorry, I didn't raise my hand. But um, I had a question about what you said about um, interactive teachers being ambiguous and open. And I find that that's very prevalent, especially in a lot of online classes. Um, and I was just wondering, how do you think we can scaffold our learners to kind of use these interactive features in a, for like a specific task? Um, yeah, so I mean, I think that's one of the tricks is we want to ensure that our learners do have some structure, right? So it's not enough to just say, hey, go for it. Um, instead, I think it's saying, here's the problem. And here are a set of eight structured tools that I'm giving you 
to be able to solve this problem. The way that you decide to use those tools is actually up to you. And here's a few tips about if you're worried about this issue. So I'm thinking, for example, right now we're working on a um, pandemic survival module about global narratives about survival in five different languages here at the University of Oregon. And so what we do is say, here's 10 or eight survival stories or five survival stories, depending on the level of your learners. Now use those to inform these different pieces. And so giving them specific examples. Remember, think about the people involved, the outside landscape, the way that these historically have been treated in these cultures. And so whatever sort of you want those pieces to be, but then allowing learners the opportunity to explore at their own pace to arrive at the solution. So looking at the process, sure, but then scaffolding that in a way that gives them some perceived agency as well, that could provide perceived agency and one choice. Or in the end, there might even be three to four possible pathways. It's not actually that many, maybe even two, but in that the learner actually decides, right, which is where the power of that is. Thanks, Julie. Um, are there any other questions? Julie? <laughs> Thank you again for the opportunity to participate, and I wish everyone a wonderful learning experience.